The African American Legend series highlights the accomplishments of blacks in areas as varied as politics, sports, aviation, business, literature, and art. We will explore how African Americans have succeeded in areas where they'd been previously excluded because of segregation, racism, and lack of opportunity. I'm your host, Dr. Roscoe C. Brown, Jr., and with us today is Danny Simmons, artist and museum sponsor, great friend. Hey, how you Good doing, you. Roscoe? How's it going? Man? Now, you always into something, Danny. You I, I really try to stay are a very a creative song. guy in the art field. What is your latest art project? Well, I mean, not, there are a couple of them. And the latest thing, the biggest thing, I, I guess, the biggest thing is that... Uh, I negotiated with a developer to do, build us and donate a building in East New York, Brooklyn, mm -hmm. uh, to the foundation where we're going to do a number of things in that community. That community is a very poor, underserved community. And right on Atlantic Avenue in Georgia, we're going to have this four-story, 7,000-square-foot building where we're going to have a number of different functions going in there. We're going to have an art gallery. There are no art galleries in East New York. We're going to have studios for artists because, you know, with real estate prices soaring and every available space in Brooklyn now being used for condos or whatever mm -hmm. they're being used for, artists are losing studio spaces everywhere. So we're going to have not that many, but we're going to have several studio spaces for these artists. We're going to have um, an area for teaching space, several areas for teaching space where people, where uh, artists come and work with kids on a daily basis in the arts. And we're going to have incubator offices for startup nonprofits for for nonprofits who are going to be working in the East New York area and then finally on the roof we have a green roof where the New York Horticultural Society is going to be working with us and our kids uh, in the art of gardening so this is a very exciting project uh, Ron Hirschko uh, a developer um, I met him and we started talking and he wanted to give something back he had developed a number of homes in East New York and he wanted to give something back to that community and um, after I told him what the foundation does and what we're doing he chose us for this great great gift what are you going to call the building we don't know yet there's you know <laughs> we've been kicking around their naming opportunities uh -huh. I mean their naming opportunities I've, at first I want to call it after the guy who's giving me the building mm -hmm. but uh, eventually may, that may be for a couple of years but I think they're naming opportunities like just like city city corp just uh, named the stadium out in Queens yeah, they should have <laughs> named it after Jackie Robinson <laughs> yeah they should have named it after Jackie <laughs> yeah. Robinson but uh, we're, we're trying to figure out what we're going to name it. Um, certainly, it's not going to be the Danny Simmons building, that's for sure. <laughs> but something we, like an arts complex, the Rush Arts Complex, well, or something we're like gonna that? Call it, we, we're definitely going to have Rush in its name. Mm -hmm. We have to have Rush in its name. It's a great branding tool. Mm -hmm. It was Russell's nickname. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, and I took that name. I said, well, everybody knows Rush. And I took that nickname of Russell's and, and stuck it in the name of the foundation. And it's worked well for us. Now, in terms of the arts, the arts is a very wide panorama. Are you going to do just visual arts or sculpture or rock art or movies? Or um, what, what are you going to do? Well, you know, the place is it's not that big, so we, we're not going to have a theater in there. Mm -hmm. But as with all our galleries, we do a number of different things in there. Largely, it's going to be visual arts. Um, mm -hmm. But we, we have dancers. Featuring Danny Simmons. No, never <laughs> featuring me. Uh, we have dancers come in. We're going to have poets come in. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to see what, what kind of talent. I, I want to focus on the talent that's in that community. Mm -hmm. Like I said, East New York uh, is a very underserved community. And, I'm sh and a lot of people are moving into that community. A lot of artists are moving into that community because they can't afford to live in any place else in Brooklyn. This is out Atlantic Avenue. It's out Atlantic Avenue. It's a block off of Pennsylvania Avenue, mm -hmm. right at that nexus right there. That's a very active nexus, it's, really. It's, it's pretty active nexus. Mm -hmm. um, and f to get a building donated there right on that corner is, is mm -hmm. an amazing thing. Um, so we, we're going to try a number of things, but mostly it's going to be visual arts. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of your own work, you've done some very, very creative work. What are you working on now? Uh, well, you know, I just had a show in California last week, uh, two weeks ago, and I have another show at Fairleigh Dickinson University in, in about a month from now. But the big thing is um, Jessica Care Moore, a very talented poet, won Apollo a million mm -hmm. times, and I had her on my show, Deaf Poetry, uh, has a publishing company. 
And Jessica's publishing, and it's coming out in January, a book of my poetry and my paintings. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be a coffee table book. And so I've, I've been thinking about that. The title of that is I Dream My People Were Calling But Couldn't Find My Way Home. Mm -hmm. And it's a mixture of my poetry and paintings. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to that coming out. And I just did another project, just, I mean, um, Sonia Sanchez, the noted poet laureate, um, Sonia asked me to illustrate a haiku of hers. Mm -hmm. And so we just put together a little pocketbook mm -hmm. uh, with my paintings and, and, and her haiku that we, we've gotten one offer on it for publication and um, we're looking around to see if we can get a better offer. Where did you first meet Sonia? I know we were at NYU and we used to bring in the artists and the poets when right. I was heading the African American Institute. Did when did you first meet her? Oh my God! I think I first met Sonia Sanchez up at City College somewhere. Mm -hmm. That's right. She was working at City College. I right? think I met her probably way back in the days when I was in college, That's exactly or a little right. bit afterwards. Mm -hmm. uh, I went up there for something, and it, it, it was a. Uh, it maybe it was a protest. Mm -hmm. There was a lot it's of pro a lot of artwork did start with protests back well, in the sixties and seventies. And she was speaking, and she read some of her poetry, yeah. and, I, and I absolutely fell in love with her poetry. And I've followed her career since then. Since then, we've we've done a lot of things together. But most notably, we've had her on Deaf Poetry, and uh, she just rocked the house with that. And uh, Sonia is one of the most talented people that uh, poets that I know. What did what attracted you to art in the first place? Whoa. Oh. I don't know if I was so much attracted to it that I, brought, I was brought up in it, mm -hmm. um, and, and it just it, it suited me. My mother painted, although she had the good time. Both of them, our mother and father had those good city jobs <laughs> that mm -hmm. we were all supposed to have gotten. Uh, but my mother taught me to paint, and my father was a writer. Uh, he wrote a couple of novels, none of them ever published, and he wrote poetry. And I used to sit down as a child and listen to his poetry all the time. And, um, and he'd read us, up, read us poetry. And so, it, you know, and they would take us to a lot of cultural institutions. So I think that's what brought me into the arts. Um, and I developed some sort of talent for it. I mean, I never went to school for it. I went to school to be a social worker. And I went to graduate school for public finance. And then one day it hit me that I was just going to change careers. And I just stopped working. And my mother said the greatest thing anyone could ever say. She said to me, uh, well, go on, pursue your dream. Nobody will let you starve. That's nice. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's always offensive. <laughs> now, you know, in, in uh, terms of your art experience, did you spend much time at uh, places like the Studio Museum or places with Romare Bearden? Or did you just explore wherever art existed? I explored. I, I didn't really have a mentor. Mm -hmm. uh, there were people I emulated. Uh, uh, all of all of the great African American masters and some of the great European masters. Who were some of the ones you emulated, African Americans? Uh, Romare Beard. Romare Beard. Uh, mm -hmm. Jacob Lawrence. Jake I Lawrence. mean, I didn't paint like them, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, their spirit in the, the facility. The the one that that I admired most it was an abstractionist, uh, uh, Norman Lewis. Mm -hmm. I was about to add. It's mentioned Norman that. Lewis yeah. it was the one who, who grabbed my heart. What about but, Benny Andrews? Oh, Benny, who just passed away. Uh, Benny's work, I love Benny's work, and I have a few pieces of his in my collection. Benny was too literal and too figurative for mm -hmm. me. When I finally st started painting in earnest, I knew I wanted to paint in abstraction. Uh, I had spent a lot of time doing figurative work, but when I started really trying to show my work, it, it took a, a, a lead towards abstraction. But Benny Andrews and I worked on a lot of projects. Recently, we've been trying to, uh, bef right before he passed, we were putting back together a New York chapter of the National Conference of Artists, which is the oldest African-American art group, and we were on a board of directors together with that. And we got a call a couple of weeks ago saying, Benny called and said, listen, I can't do this anymore. I got to go in the hospital. Uh, I got cancer. And uh, he, he passed away very quickly yeah, after that. Yeah. Benny was quite a creative guy. Not only mm -hmm. that, but he was a great activist. Mm -hmm. He was an arts he activist. He was an art activist. <laughs> um, and I took a lot mm -hmm. of my leads from Benny. I mean, when he saw injustices, he did something about mm -hmm. it. He didn't just talk about it. Now, that's the thing I'm interested in. Your inspiration. Is it a political inspiration? Is it an emotional inspiration? Or is it a philosophical inspiration? Um... The, the, I, you know, I, I don't think it's political. I think it's it's emotional. I think it's philosophical, and I think it's social. Um, when I started 
being more than just a painter, uh, uh, I started creating galleries out of a need that I saw that African Americans were not being represented in the mainstream galleries. And so I started putting up my own shows different places, which uh, was filling, filling a niche. I mean, we didn't have, as, as artists, many places to show, so I started my first gallery with that in mind. Uh, I started the foundation with something similar in mind that all the money had been taken out of the schools for the arts and we needed to have a facility to f close that gap and so I, I got a 501c uh, and um, uh, started the foundation we went about the task of raising money so we could do something and Russell I talked to Russell and he, he joined me with it and we raised in our first year $250,000. This year, this summer at our fundraiser, we raised $1.4 million. Mm -hmm. uh, we got a, a call. Pays to be known. Huh? Pays to be known. It pays <laughs> to be known and it pays to work hard. That's right. Uh, known helps, but we have a great team of people and a great executive director, Tangi Murray, who goes out and gets those corporate dollars. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, uh, I just had a meeting over at Time Warner about the building that we're gonna be handed over to us by the end of the year in East mm -hmm. New York, and they've committed $25,000 and are gonna give us a fundraiser at, at, at Lincoln Center, for Jazz at Lincoln Center for, for that uh, effort. You know, arts have always struggled in this country, <clears throat> and probably one of the heyday periods of the arts was during the Depression, with the WPA, the Works right. Progress Administration, where they hired artists to do all these wonderful pieces in the hospitals and schools and public buildings. To what extent can we do that now? Uh, well, I don't know what sense the government can do that. Uh, well, I, I think they, they can. They can. They can. Yeah. I mean, what extent they want to, that's a better way of putting it. Uh, but, I, but, I, but I think that one of the things that we as a people and we as artists need to learn is to be a little more self-reliant. And mm -hmm. that... I, I really, when I first started this foundation, I did not go to corporations or government for uh, money. I, I got money directly from auctioning off artist art mm -hmm. and then giving back to the community and from private donations. Uh, I think that's still pretty much the way to go. I think government should be pushed and prodded into supporting its arts because arts define what a country are, arts define what a people are. Um, but if you always wait for somebody else, to, to give you something and you can't do anything and you're, you're stuck because they haven't given it to you, then you're in trouble and you might not realize your goals. And so we have to find ways as people, as, as artists, to accomplish what we need to do on our own. I mean, any four walls and a bottle of wine and mm -hmm. an invitation can make an art show. Mm -hmm. I mean, and you build from there, and that's exactly how I started doing art shows. I found a wall and some artists and mm -hmm. put it up there uh, and continue to build. It's a building process, and it's, and it's a process of bringing people to your idea and having them support you. Um, waiting for government, I think government should chip in, and I think government has a big role to play. But if they're not gonna play it, it's not gonna stop us. Well, clearly it's not going to stop you, but let's look at the history of art in the world. Mm -hmm. The great artists were always supported by some patron, right. some rich person. The church. Who decided the to, or the church, and, and that's part of government. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a little too easy on government to say that they shouldn't be supporting For example, there was at one time a uh, regulation that said a certain percent of the money for a given building would be used for art. That's true. I know when they built the Rockefeller Towers up in Albany, and they had some beautiful art there in that concourse. Mm -hmm. They had some Jacob Lawrence from Norman Lewis and so on. I think that you ought to sort of get to work and start well, negotiating on that because it isn't a gift. No, it's, it's not a gift. It's something that it comes makes out of your the, tax monies. The, and not only, it's something that makes the building and the society more welcoming. So of I course. think that this is a, particularly now that we have Charlie Rangel and the Ways and Means Committee and, and the Democrats Congress, just won again. We, let's get some money for art and buildings. Well, That's we're certainly going to ask. But one of the things we're going to not only ask government, uh, but we're also going to ask private developers mm -hmm. who are changing the That's nature true. of our landscape mm -hmm. and, our, and, our, and our communities. And since there are no spaces for us, we need to talk about affordable housing for the arts. And we need to, you know, the government needs you need to, to have regulation. Affordable housing for everybody. For everybody. <laughs> well, you know, for, for artists in particular, but everybody certainly. <laughs> but, you know, uh, and I've had conversations with a number of the large Brooklyn developers about just that thing. Uh, this guy that gave me the building is building 
two other condo buildings, one in Long Island City and one in Dumbo, and at the base of each of those buildings yeah. is going to be an art gallery. Mm -hmm. So he's going to have spaces for that. And that's out of a sense of social conscious, and that's out of a sense that he needs to be in those neighborhoods where mm -hmm. the arts are and support what those, why those neighborhoods mm -hmm. are hot for him to be in. And I think artists can make that clear mm -hmm. as, as a block, a political action block or a social action block mm -hmm. to let people know that you are t putting something into our mm -hmm. community where we're at, and you also need to, to, to be able to help us sustain what this community is about. And I think government's role in that is just like you said, that anytime something has to be built, there might be tax write-offs, there might be tax mm -hmm. incentives for people to come in, mm -hmm. private people to come in and develop uh, with, with, with sensibilities in mind. Now, here you talk about your business background, your 501c and so on. Do you do any courses to help artists learn how to market their work, how to carry out the business aspect of it? Well, I mean, I've done a number of them last year at Pratt Institute. Mm -hmm. uh, Tom Schutte is a great friend, of course, he runs Pratt Institute mm -hmm. of the Arts, but a great friend also of community. Um, I set up a number of courses like that. I, as a board member of the New York Foundation for the Arts, I was part of making sure that the courses, but also now as the marketing, uh, the vice chair of the marketing, I'm a board member of the Brooklyn Museum. One of the things I, uh, we want to do is bring more educational courses in there for adults mm -hmm. and artists. And I want to make museums not just places that are uh, repositories of arts, but something that helps develop the arts as it goes along. Uh, and Brooklyn Museum is open to that sort of idea. So we are going to be doing things that enhance artists' careers and help develop them and move them along. As an artist, <coughs> a creative person, what do you use as a motivator to help you create some of these works oh that's a whew. Uh, I you know I have a, in my apartment or uh, my loft I have a thousand or so art artifacts African and, and contemporary art. so every time I walk anywhere in my house mm -hmm. I, I'm catching something that, that that's a motivation but I also a great believer in spirituality and the spirituality that our ancestors have left us and the legacy that our ancestors have left. And I think they're also guiding forces in the creative process. Uh, if you look backwards, you can always look forward because you can see where you came from. So I think that a lot of what inspires me is who we are, who we've been, and who we aspire to be. And if you look at those things, um, you know, those things are enough to put you on any path to create something to help that process along. Are artists born or are they made? Both. Okay, develop that. Uh, I think everybody's born with a creative impulse. I think the nature of being a human being is to bring something new. Um, mm -hmm. And so, I, I, but I also think that sort of talent needs, to, that we all have, needs to be nurtured. Mm -hmm. And so that's the role schools need to play, the roles like my foundation. We support over 70 organizations that work with children in and around New York City. And our job is to nurture these kids, not necessarily be artists, but to find that creative spot in them where they can learn to think outside of the box and think in terms of bringing something new to the world. It doesn't have to be a piece of art. It could be a business. But the same type of thinking goes into creating a business as goes into creating art. You have to think of new ways to look at things, new ways to look at the world. And I think that art classes are the primary way kids can learn how to do that. What about censorship in the arts? <clears throat> Every once in a while, some figure comes out. It's a <laughs> sexual figure, religious figure, whatever. Something, something uh, pisses people rate, off. It, it, uh, <laughs> and people say you shouldn't censor the arts. On the other hand, some things can literally be offensive to given groups of people. How do you, how do you relate to that? Um, you know, that's, that's always a question um, about censorship. I, I, I'm totally against censorship. Um, I think that People, artists themselves should censor themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, if, the, if you know, I don't think that these should uh, censorship to be. If I know what audience like, if I, if I know I'm going to have an audience uh, of kids coming in, I have a collection of nudes. Mm -hmm. I have a, a collection of nude photography. I don't take the kids to that section. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I take them to someplace else in the house. Look at the African art, mm -hmm. because I don't, I don't want to offend anybody. Mm -hmm. But I, I certainly believe in the artist's right to take mm -hmm. those pictures. Mm -hmm. I think that everything, uh, you know, should should be done with a sort of who your audience is in, in mind. But I think adults have the right to choose what they want to look at and not look at. Mm -hmm. You know, I think some things should not be imposed upon children, some sorts of languages, some sorts of things. But, you know, that's for, you know, somebody other than me to decide. I mean, 
I, I have my own sensibilities. I, I, I don't believe in censorship in any way, though. I don't think people should be censored in any way that they create. I think, though, that people should also be a little more sensitive to who to, who's going to be looking at their work and what kind of impact it would have on them. Well, that's always been an issue, particularly in this country, with the First Amendment. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we found art that is quasi-political mm -hmm. that gets trashed because of its political content rather than because of its artistic content. Well, you know, I have a great friend, an uh, artist named Dred Scott, mm -hmm. who, who, who thoroughly angered the first President Bush. Mm -hmm. um, he had an um, installation of how he had to sign a book, but you had to walk across a flag to get to the book mm -hmm. to sign it, to, to, to register a protest. And that's one of the things that uh, got the funding from the National Endowment of the Arts mm -hmm. cut down uh, mm -hmm. was that. And for him being censored, that was just more fuel for more political art from mm -hmm. Dredd because it gave him another platform and another <laughs> issue. The same thing with Andre Serrano, who had a different approach to it, and he had this uh, this f f photograph called Piss Christ, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it was around the same time that this happened. And they pointed to those two things mm -hmm. as that the government should not be paying for mm -hmm. art like this. I don't think the government paid for either of those two pieces, mm -hmm. of, but, but it gave the conservatives a, a, mm -hmm. a platform on which to stand on. Sometimes repression has a completely opposite effect. I mean, with Renee Cox's piece, uh, The Last Supper, where she's standing yeah. there and mm -hmm. Giuliani um, uh, wanted to shut down the Brooklyn Museum and yeah. take all their funding, it just rallied the art mm -hmm. community together and it rallied people together more to, to, to and made Renee Cox's career, even though it was a big career at that time, so mm -hmm. much bigger. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have to be careful <laughs> because usually what you try to do doesn't always have the right, the same mm -hmm. effect that you're trying to have mm -hmm. it. You know, a little opposition sometimes is not a bad thing. We don't want to fall into complacency. Do you have a website where our viewers could go and find out about your museum and some oh, of the sure. activities? Oh, sure. You can go to www.rushphilanthropic.org. Is that uh, Rush Philanthropic, one word? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. rushphilanthropic.org and, and take a look at that and that talks about the foundation and you can see some of my um, work online I must have about 80 or 90 paintings on this website uh, it's called uh, thecorridorgallery.org and you can s read about what I'm doing and you can read uh, my bio, my resume and see a bunch of my artwork. Now when um, when artists price their work how do they go about that? You know, different ways. Uh, if you're lucky enough to be working with a gallery, the, the gallerist uh, knows where you're at, will have an idea where you're at in your career mm -hmm. and will sort of price it appropriately. I mean, people, one of the things young artists do, they get out of art school and they think they're going to conquer the world <laughs> and they put all these high prices. I think Training is part of it, and you look at the training that you've been through, you look at the number of shows you had, you look at the time that you put into the painting, you look at the size, or I keep saying painting because I'm a painter, but you know, it's all kinds of different things. You look at the size of it, the type of, the type of work it is. Um, but you know, uh, you're also guided by what the market will bear. Mm -hmm. You know, you can put anything you want on something mm -hmm. if somebody's not willing to pay that. And that's why I think that, you know, uh, you need to be sensitive also to who your audience is. You know, if you're showing in a community gallery and you're going to ask somebody for $10,000, you're going to have a piece on the wall. If you're showing on 57th Street, that's a different thing. I don't think the prices should fluctuate, but you should know where you're at in your career. and You should make an honest assessment of where you're at in your career and and sort of try to price it to where, where you're at and not try to price it at, at comparison to what other people get for uh, for work that's of similar size and composition. Now, as, as an artist, <clears throat> museum coordinator, philanthropist, etc., what advice would you give to, let's say, a young high school student who wants to go into the art world? Um, the first thing I, I, I would do recommend is that they do really well in school, uh, in high school, so they can get in a good art school. Mm -hmm. uh, like do well, you mean with the academic Academically. Work. Yeah. I mm -hmm. mean, art schools are like any other school. A large part of your getting in there is not based on how well you can draw or paint or anything else. It's based on how well you do in school. Mm -hmm. Art schools are colleges. So you really have to study hard and, and, and be a good student. And also you need to practice what what you want your craft to be later on. Um, 
But the other thing is when you get in there and you're moving a little bit along, you need to do internships. You need mm -hmm. to do internships in galleries. You need to do internships with museums, you foundations, art foundations. You need to immerse yourself in the art world in any way you can to be a part of the conversation that's going on in there, to know the people that are going on. It's just like any other field, you know. It's, it's not always what you know, but who you know. And so you need, you know, you can't come in as an outsider and expect mm -hmm. to get, you need to be there and know these people and let them know who you are and what you can do. Are there opportunities for some of these artists to intern with okay. you and Rush and so oh, on? There, there's always opportunities to intern at Rush. We have interns at Rush. We have inter interns at each of the galleries. So Rush the Foundation. Mm -hmm. We have two galleries and going to have three. We have Rush Arts Gallery in Chelsea. We have the Carter Gallery in Brooklyn. Now we're going to have the new gallery. So there'll be opportunities at three galleries and at the foundation proper. And then there's also sometimes opportunities at so many of the organizations that we give grants to. They're always looking for somebody to come in and help out. And, you know, you know, we can always um, help to try to direct you to where you can go. And outside of my thing, we can always recommend where you can go. And we, we know a large network of people that we might be able to send somebody to. Well, today we've been talking with Danny Simmons about art, art in Brooklyn, museums, business, etc. You've given us a good insight into what it takes to be an artist. And <laughs> just keep on doing the good stuff. Uh, there's so much more I, I, that I have to learn, but uh, it's a day-to-day -day process. Okay. I appreciate being here. Thank you, Danny. Okay.